The following is a conversation with Dr. Klaus Pontopidan. Dr. Pontopidan is an astronomer and a James Webb Space Telescope project scientist at the Space Telescope Science Institute, the STSCI, located in Baltimore, Maryland. The STSCI is the Science Operations Center for the Hubble Space Telescope. It's also the Mission Operations Center for the James Webb Space Telescope, the JWST, which is the latest and the most advanced space telescope launched thus far. The following conversation is mostly about the James Webb Space Telescope. Dr. Klaus Pontobidan, thank you very much for doing this. Thank you and, and welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. So uh, you work with the STSCI, the Space Telescope Science Institute. Could you explain what it does? Sure. Uh, this, the Space Telescope Science Institute uh, operates space telescopes. Uh, it was originally created to operate the uh, Hubble Space Telescope. So that's something we've done for more than 30 years. Uh, and now we're operating the new James Webb Space Telescope as well. And so what does it mean to operate a space telescope? Uh, well, it means that uh, we have the control center in our building, uh, but we also uh, organize the contact to the international scientific community astronomers around the world who are using these space telescopes to do their science, uh, make sure that they can do what they need to do, um, submit their experiments to the telescope and to get the data back and help them process it so that they can get the science out of it that they need. Right. So how do you communicate with these telescopes, with Hubble and with the James Webb? So, so with the James Webb, uh, we communicate uh, with that through what's called the Deep Space Network. Uh, so mm -hmm. the Deep Space Network is uh, is a network of radio telescopes around the world. Webb uses uh, radio telescopes or radio dishes, say, uh, in in Madrid, um, in Goldstone, in the in the United States, and in Canberra, in in Australia. So that you know, no matter what time of of day or night it is, there's always a radio dish where the uh, the observatory is right above. Right. So what is the James Webb Space Telescope and why was it needed? Is it a replacement for Hubble or is it something else entirely? So we like to think of uh, Webb as, as more complementary to Hubble than, than a direct uh, replacement. It can really do so different science than what, what Hubble could do. So, so the, in short, the, the James Webb Space Telescope is, is NASA's next flagship mission. Uh, so the flagship missions are the biggest NASA-led missions. Um, it's also an international collaboration, so it has significant contributions from the European and Canadian space agencies, and it is available for use to um, any scientist or astronomer in the world who has a good idea. Um, so it's really, it's a general purpose astronomical observatory. It, it will address, uh, you know, almost every area within astrophysics in one way or another. Um, and it will be expected to produce beautiful images like, like Hubble did as well. So I have been hearing of this telescope since I was a student, like mid 90s onwards, I've been hearing about it. And the launch date has been pushed back several times. And in the mid 90s, it, it was not called the James Webb, but there was the, the, the concept was there. So uh, why did it take over three decades of planning? Why, why has it been delayed so much? Sure, yeah. So, yeah, it was originally called the Next Generation Space Telescope back in the mid-90s when it started. And you're absolutely right. It's been more than 25 years uh, in the making. But uh, I think this is basically the nature of these flagship observatories. We're, we're, we're building them pretty much as big as we can so that they can answer some of these very biggest questions that, that humanity has. Um, so there's uh, one important difference from James Webb and to Hubble, and that is that Hubble was originally designed to be serviceable in space. It's in low Earth orbit. It could be reached by the space shuttle. And there were a number of, of servicing missions, um, you know, famously one that that fixed uh, a flaw in the in the focus of the uh, of the Hubble mirror. And so it would never have been as successful if we weren't able to service it. With Webb, Webb uh, is not in low Earth orbit. Webb is out at a point in space called L2, which is a million miles away, four times the distance of the moon. And so currently we have no capabilities uh, to send astronauts out there to fix it if something goes wrong. Um, and so that means that we had to make the design of the Webb telescope very um, robust. Right? And, and what that 
does is it requires a lot of testing on the ground, making sure that any kind of error, or any kind of problem that happens to it happens on the ground before we launch it, because once it's launched, we wouldn't be able to fix it. Um, and so that has caused a uh, you know, number of delays to make sure that, that things work properly. And I think we can see right now, like we, we launched it and on, uh, on Christmas morning uh, last year, and, uh, and so far things are going really well. And I think a lot of that is attributable to all the testing that we did over the years. And uh, the, the budget was about $10 billion, right? So why, why was it so expensive? Oh, so yeah, space, space is expensive. Um, that, that is just the nature of things. Uh, web is uh, the primary mirror of it, which is sort of the, the, the core uh, property of, of any telescope. It's the size of the, the mirror is, is six and a half meters uh, compared to Hubble's 2.4 meters. It's by far the biggest infrared space telescope ever put in, into space. Um, and so to do do that, uh, have that development cycle over 25 years, uh, if you break that down in, 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 do in dollars money per year, um, it's actually not not that much. Um, so so that is that is what space costs. I think that's what you have to, to expect. Right. So so how is, what's new about the James Webb? How is it different from and superior to the Hubble and the Spitzer, which was the previous infrared telescope? So there, there was an original reason for building Web, a original scientific reason. Um, and that was uh, to detect the, the first galaxies in the universe as they're just forming, right? Any telescope is a, is a time machine, right? Because light takes time to travel to us. Um, and so light from the, the, the other end of the visible universe has taken um, you know, more than 13 and a half billion years to travel to us. Um, so one of the most famous and iconic images that Hubble took is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field image, which is where they pointed Hubble, this is before my time, but they pointed Hubble at an empty spot in the sky and, and just stared at it for 10 days on end. Um, and there were people back in the day who said, a lot of people said, this is a, this is a terrible idea. Uh, you know, why are you wasting this very expensive telescope time to stare at an empty spot in the sky? Well, what came out of it is that this empty spot in the sky is filled with these with distant galaxies, thousands of galaxies. This image allowed us to estimate how many galaxies there are in the visible universe. Uh, but but another thing that came out of this is also that this image did not see the first galaxies in the universe. And why not? Well, you know, one of the, one of the other properties of the universe is that it, it's expanding. Right? So since the Big Bang is expanding, so what happens when light is emitted from one of these distant galaxies? It travels through the universe, and as this light travels through the universe, it is stretched along with the universe as the universe grows. And so the color of the light is dependent on the, the wavelength of light. It's basically a wave, right? And so that wave is stretched along with the universe. So longer wavelength means redder light, um, and and very red light is what what we call infrared light. It's been stretched out of of uh, the ability of the human eye to see it. And so the Hubble Space Telescope is designed to be a telescope that operates at visible wavelengths, the wavelengths that we can see for the most part. And so this is this very, very ancient, this old light from the very first galaxies uh, has been stretched more than Hubble can see it. So we can redshift it beyond the capability of Hubble. So we always knew that we had to build an infrared telescope, a telescope that worked at these wavelengths, that's optimized for these wavelengths, to be able to see that light. So no matter, it's said, said another way, right? No matter how long Hubble would stare at a point in the sky, if you spend 100 days, you would never see these galaxies because the light they emit is just not visible to Hubble. Right. So why is this telescope parked at L2, this, uh, the L2 Lagrange point? Why not the other ones, L1, L3, L4, L5? Why L2? What is special uh, about L2? Mm -hmm. Great, great question. So an infrared telescope like Webb, it has to be cold. Um, so so the Webb is, is the mirror itself has to be colder than 50 degrees Kelvin, almost minus 400 degrees Fahrenheit, and extremely cold. Because anything that has, has a temperature emits light. And if you emit if anything that has a say, room temperature, like Hubble is basically a room temperature telescope, uh, emits lots and lots of infrared light. So if you have a warm telescope and you try to see anything in infrared, it's like observing or using a telescope in broad daylight. It just gets overwhelmed by its own infrared emission. So it has to be really cold. So it never worked to have a uh, web in low Earth orbit because there it would get heated by the Earth. Earth is like this big heat lamp. So you send it out to, to L2, where it's far enough away from the Earth and Moon uh, to, to be cold. And then it has this big, a big sun shield. Actually, I can show. I have a model here. 
this. Wow, it's, look at that. <laughs> yeah, so it's like a 3D printed model. So you can see the this uh, the sun, sun shield here below, which basically you would have the, the sun below here. Um, and it, it makes sure that uh, the telescope itself here, which is uh, the mirror in the front here, it has instruments on the back here. Those are always kept in perpetual shade. And that allows it to cool to these very, very low temperatures. So you ask why L2? Well, L2 is the is the point that is on the other side of of from the sun, from both the Earth and the Moon, and so that allows with the sun shield here to 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 have Earth and Moon and all these other and Sun all at the same side. Now, if you were at L1, for example, that's a point that's in between the Earth and the Sun. And so you would then, no matter where you would turn the telescope, you would always have the sun on one side, the Earth on another, and you wouldn't be in shade. And it's the same thing for L3 and and uh, uh, L4 and so on. So L2 is really, really the the only point that that this is possible. And yet the telescope is not exactly at L2; it's orbiting L2. So how can something orbit nothing? Ah, oh, yeah, no, it's, it's a it's a good it's a good question. It's it it gets into a little bit of of complex uh, orbital dynamics, but like to, to to explain L two sort of in a very very basic way, uh, it it's it's a point that that allows the observatory to follow the Earth around the Sun. So normally, if you have an orbit around a star, the farther you are away from that star, the slower you go. That's Kepler's law, and so that's just how gravity works. Um, an L2 point is a point that that uh, depends on the existence of two massive bodies. In this case, it's the Sun and the Earth. It's a point where the combined gravity of the Sun and the Earth allows the observatory to orbit a little faster than it otherwise would. And so it's like having a dog on a leash. Right? It, uh, uh, Earth drags it along a little bit faster, and so it means we never drift away from the Earth. Then when you do the, the orbital calculations, it turns out that um, well, for one thing, you, you wouldn't want to be exactly at, um, uh, at L2 because the Earth would, uh, would uh, eclipse the sun. And we do need the sun on the, uh, on the solar panel here on the warm side. Otherwise, we wouldn't have power. Uh, but also, when you do the calculations, it turns out that the most stable orbits that uh, lead us to use have to use the least propellant ends up being this big orbit around L2. So it's a, it's a very efficient orbit in terms of, of fuel. So is the telescope entirely powered by solar power or does it have anything else on it? It is entirely powered by solar power, nothing else. I see. Mm -hmm. And uh, what about the design? What what are the instruments that the, that the telescope is carrying? So the, the telescope is carrying four science instruments um, and one additional instrument that is used to guide the, the telescope that's used to make sure that it can point very accurately to its targets, called the fine guidance sensor. Uh, so the four uh, science instruments is, is NearCam, uh, which is uh, a camera um, working in near infrared wavelengths. Um, and it had it has a number of other all these instruments have a lot of complicated modes. Uh, then there's uh, there's near spec, which is a near infrared spectrometer. Um, there's nearest, which is a, a near infrared uh, slitless spectrograph, uh, which is also optimized to observe exoplanets and to measure their composition. And then there's the mid infrared instrument, which is the only instrument that works at the longest wavelengths, where you're really sensitive to colder, say, dust or molecules. And why is the mirror made of gold? Why not something else? Why was gold required for it? So gold is 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 the best, one of the very best uh, materials to reflect infrared light, and that that that's why it's on it. So it's, it's 99 percent of infrared light that hits a gold gold coated surface that will get reflected. So it's a very efficient uh, material for that light. It's not very good for visible light. Uh, so blue light, for example you only reflect about half of it. And that's the reason for, for the golden color, right? It does not reflect blue light very well, so it becomes golden. But once you add an infrared, it's really almost all of it. Um, so so that's, that's, the, that's, the basic, uh, that's the basic reason you'll see a lot of infrared telescopes being coated, coated in gold. Of course, the, the, the mirror itself is not made of gold. It's a very, very thin coating. The, the mirror itself is made of a material called beryllium. I see. 
and what is the status right now? So I, I hear it's being calibrated right now. So uh, how long will that process last? Yeah, so, so, so what we're doing right now is so we've gone through this process of unfolding the telescope. Right? It's yeah. famously, it, 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 it's too big, was too big to fit inside the rockets. So the mirror itself had to be unfolded. This big sun shield had to be unfolded. And so right now, the two things are happening. Uh, the first thing is that we're still cooling. Uh, cooling in space is actually not very efficient. Uh, because you don't have any air to draw away the heat. It has to, all the heat has to radiate away. It takes a while. So we're still cooling. Uh, uh, and so it takes still you know, a month or so before we're really cold, um, uh, or at least at operational temperature. Uh, the other thing is happening is that the mirror it, itself um, is too large, to, or is too large to be a single mirror. So it consists of 18 individual segments. Um, and those individual segments, their shape and their position can change. So there are little motors that sit behind them that can move their position and can even change the shape of the mirror itself. Um, and so what's happening right now is that engineers are focusing the mirror to make sure that it's, it's, it's in focus. That's a process that is very cumbersome. It takes a long time, it takes several months to do that. Um, and so only in a couple of months, the telescope itself will be focused. And that's when you can start to calibrate the instruments, make sure the instruments work for the scientific purposes uh, and, and so on, you know, measure their uh, exact geometry and so on, all these things we have to do. So the whole, the whole process takes six months from launch. And so we would expect to see the first science images uh, sometime this summer. The summer, right. So what are the principal objectives as of right now at this point? Right, so I mentioned already that to, to, to detect those first galaxies, so they're big programs yeah. that, you know, that, that basically start with something like the Hubble Ultra Deep Field and then goes much beyond that. Um, a second big objective that is often talked about um, is, the, is, is the characterization of exoplanet atmospheres. So Webb is not a, not a telescope that will necessarily find a lot of new planets, but it will be able to look at planets we already know are there and uh, using a special technique called transit spectroscopy, where the planet moves in front of its star. And so only a few, few uh, small percentage of planets actually do this have for, have with, through a fortuitous uh, geometry. But if this happens, part of the stellar light will be filtered through the planet's atmosphere and some uh, 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 molecules in that uh, planet's atmosphere will be able to absorb certain colors of that light. And that allows the powerful spectrographs on, on web to determine what, what those atmospheres are made of, and indeed whether they're atmospheres at all. Um, so that characterization of, of planets is, is a very big uh, aspect as well. But also, as I mentioned, um, we have almost 400 individual investigations already lined up in the first year of observations. And these span all over astrophysics. There's so many exciting things there. And I'm certain that once we start getting data, right, this, 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 this telescope is so powerful that, um, you know, depending on which mode you use or which wavelength you're looking at, it, it, it's able to see uh, objects that are maybe 100 times fainter than what was ever possible before. So, you know, we're only human as scientists. We can try and predict what we will see. But, you know, we, we know we, we're not able to predict. We'll, we'll find new things. We'll make new discoveries that we had no idea was there. Um, so that discovery space is another big uh, objective of a flagship observatory such as this. So is the mission fully booked for the next year or is there any any space for additional stuff? Um, so yes and no. Um, in principle, we are we, we have already booked the telescope for actually for more than a year. Um, so, so normally we, we assign uh, time in, in these year blocks, but... Um, because the observatory can't see every point in the sky at any given time, because you always have to keep the, the telescope in the shade from the sun, uh, we don't want to get to the end of that year and not have any programs left. So we actually even oversubscribe. So we have more than 10,000 hours of time allocated already. And so if you do the, do the math, you'll find that a year has 8,760 hours and change. So we have more. Than that. But... There are, it is possible, uh, and there is some time of, sort of set aside, or at least the, the possibility to set aside, that if somebody discovers something very exciting, you know, whatever it is, uh, you know, uh, 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 another comet impacts Jupiter, or, you know, there's a very exciting supernova or something like that, that we just didn't predict, uh, we'll make sure that, that we'll observe something like that. Right. So how are these mission objectives determined? Who proposes what science to do? 
so the science is basically proposed by the uh, uh, by astronomers out in the world. Um, there is a little bit of uh, what we call guaranteed time, which is time that is given to the scientists and people who designed and built the instruments. Um, so that accounts for about a third of the time in the first year. And the other two thirds is really for scientists around the world. So anybody, uh, any astronomer anywhere who has a good idea can submit uh, a proposal, um, you know, proposing to do their experiment, asking, say, I, I would like to look at this target. I would like to look at this kind of targets. Uh, it will take, you know, X amount of hours. Um, and then there is a, there's a big panel uh, that evaluate these proposals. And this panel consists of members from the same community, right? It's peer reviewed. And we invite people from, again, from all over the world to serve on these panels. So we don't select, as an institution, we don't select the proposals. You know, the people select the proposals. So it's it's a people's telescope in, in that sense. And every year there'll be another solicitation. There will be a new opportunity for scientists around the world to propose to use a telescope. And we hope it, it will function for many years so that uh, so we'll have a lot of exciting science that we haven't predicted yet. Right. So you said that this is like a time machine. It will help us look back in time, maybe see the formation of the first galaxies and all that. What other discoveries can we expect? What mysteries do you think could be resolved using this telescope? Well, it's it's. I think at a, at a very high level, right? It's it's it's. These are all questions of that are very fundamental. I think to humanity, like where do we come from? Um, are we alone? Is is the Earth? Uh, a rare kind of planet, or is it a co relatively common kind of planet? Right there, there we we think that there there's probably a trillion or more planets in the um, in the galaxy alone, right? Or many more in the universe, uh, but we just have still have no idea if potentially habitable planets like the Earth are really rare or not. We just don't know, and I think Webb will will take some of those those big steps to to answering. Um, that kind of question. And it, that'll be done in many, many ways, um, you know, from looking at mature planets and see what they're made of uh, to trying to understand how planets are formed, how how they get the, the life, you know, the molecules, or the, the elements, the ingredients that are really necessary for life, how they, how they end up on planets. Right? If you know from our own Earth, from, you know, essentially archaeological evidence from four and a half billion years ago when the earth formed uh, that uh, a lot of the material that in principle was present like water then the nitrogen in our atmosphere atmosphere 70 percent nitrogen uh, uh, is it actually only made it to the earth through an arduous process it was it's it was hard to get there only one out of a million available nitrogen atoms made it to the earth like only a one, one out of a thousand water molecules made it to the earth so hard to get there because the earth formed in a warm place and in order to get water here it has to be in a frozen form and so that doesn't that doesn't fit right so water got delivered potentially later by by uh, asteroids or comets and so questions like does this happen in other places or is this, is this very stochastic process it's very random process that enabled earth to be a life-bearing planet um so again it's 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 hard to predict exactly how that process, how that scientific process will go once we have data. But we have this incredible power now to, you know, we make the first experiment, we try something and we get an answer back. And that allows us to, or allows scientists to ask the next questions and just and go on that journey over, over a number of years and to see where it takes us. And uh, we have stars like Betelgeuse where you have the star that's enveloped in a dust cloud. So could pointing this telescope at that star, for instance, help us understand it better? Uh, uh, but potentially. Now, Be Betelgeuse is a very bright star. And, and you do have a, sort of a trade-off when you make this big, very sensitive telescope. And generally, you can't point it to extremely bright stars. Just it doesn't have that dynamic range. You basically overwhelm the instruments. So Betelgeuse is a, is a star that's too bright for, for web. We could point it to it, but... It would overwhelm the instruments, but you can certainly look at, at other stars like that. And and in infrared telescope is you know why you can see the first galaxies is also excellent, as you said, to to look at dust in various ways. Right, there are two things like dust. The, the universe is full of dust, and uh, dust does two things. Right, it, it it obscures 
visible light it doesn't allow visible light to go through it so if you're interested in what happens behind that dust whether it's um, looking at forming stars and planets those are embedded in these big clouds of gas and dust and so a telescope that works at visible wavelengths can penetrate those clouds and to see inside you need the infrared and, and web can do that but web can also use infrared light to, to tell what the dust and the gas is made of in the infrared range is is what some people call the molecular fingerprint region so um using using spectrographs that break up the infrared light into its individual colors uh you can look at different uh, different molecules, they will emit different colors of infrared light. Um, and so basically by taking spectra of, of dust and gas, you can, you can say, you can tell if there's water there, you can tell if there's methane there. Uh, and it's the same kind of features you use to, to tell if that's the case in, in an exoplanetary atmosphere or in an interstellar cloud or in, in many other regions. So it, it's a molecular telescope in many ways. And could it help us understand supermassive black holes, active galactic nuclei, things like that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, there are there are really uh, uh, important programs early on in the first year that will look at this growth of of uh, black holes, uh, supermassive black holes, in, in in particular in the in the early universe. Right? There's a, there's sort of an ongoing, I say, mystery or question uh, of of how those form when we know today that every, almost every galaxy, including our Milky Way has a supermassive black hole at its, at its center. And those were formed early on in the, in the galaxy's evolution. And it appears that those, those black supermassive black holes may have formed really early, earlier than we have seen so far. And in this formation, they've got to become very bright. Right? So you have, you, you put a lot of, lot of mass together in one spot, it heats up and becomes very bright. But if it's a distant in the universe, it's, again, that light as it's traveled through the universe, it's very old. It's, it's, it has shifted out of Hubble's wavelengths and we need web to see that. But we think we'll be able to pick up those early information events of supermassive black holes. And is there any way this telescope could help us understand primordial black holes? So, for instance, we have these microlensing experiments that were done in the first decade of the 2020 of the uh, 21st century. So, could this have any microlensing applications, for instance? Um, so, you think yes and no. Um, so, um, Webb is not a. Uh, uh, survey telescope it, it, it it's it's it will looks at a small part of the sky like if you want to look at a, a teeny it. teeny um it's kind of like hubble i mean hubble is the same if you wanted to look at a very large part of the sky then you need a different different telescope but there, there is one right there's uh that the the observatory that's been developed by nasa right now to follow uh, at least in terms of time follow web is the uh, the roman space telescope uh which is like a hubble sized telescope but it has a much wider field of view. And that telescope is mm -hmm. designed to identify these microlensing events. These are rare events. So you have to survey a big part of the sky with, with a very sensitive camera. And then once in a while, you suddenly you see something get, get, uh, get brighter and you have this microlensing event. Um, uh, but what, what we can do, and, and we think that this is where it's good news that that web will will hopefully work for many years is that those two telescopes can work in synergy can work together so that roman if it it, if it finds microlensing events web is more sensitive so it can go and look at that event in greater detail um, so that that could be an important synergy but not not to find individual microlensing events web is probably not the best so when is roman expected to launch um I don't know what the latest date. I think it's uh, um, so it's in the, it's in the latter half of this decade, um, mm -hmm. maybe twenty twenty seven or something like that. Is what I'm I see. Yes. Yeah. Right. And and what about dark matter and dark energy? That's that's really interesting. Ninety five percent of the universe. Could uh, JWST help us understand any of that better? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, dark matter is. I mean, something that existed in the universe before uh, galaxies formed and dark, uh, dark matter probably uh, drove the formation of galaxies, right? So you start out with these clumps of dark matter in the very early universe. Um, and the dark matter has, um, has gravity and that gravity allows us to, to collect gas um, into that gravity well and that is that is that gas that ultimately forms early galaxies um 
the nature of dark matter it can be revealed by the distribution of these the size of these what's called dark matter halos dark matter clumps like how many small ones there are relative to how many big ones there are and we can see that potentially with Webb in figuring out how many small early galaxies there are versus how many large early galaxies are. So these are these are answers we don't have yet, but something can tell us about the property of the, of the dark matter early on. And so that helps us to infer something about what physics is really going on uh, with, with dark matter. Um, and another way to look at dark matter, which which has always been exciting to me, it's just it's a fascinating uh, concept, is this, this uh, uh, concept of gravitational lensing. Uh, like what does that mean? Well, it means that 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 light doesn't uh, light doesn't travel in straight lines through matter. Like matter actually can bend the path of light through general relativity, and we can see this on cosmic scales. We can already see this this now on on, on cosmic scale scales with Hubble and, and other things. Um, so when you when you look at say a, a, a distant a distant galaxy cluster, that cluster, the mass in it, which is mostly dark matter, will bend light of galaxies that are behind it. And so, by looking at how it bends that light, it actually tells us something about the distribution of dark matter in that galaxy cluster. Um, and Webb will have will have programs to to do that, look at that in more detail than ever before. And what about dark energy? Anything uh, the James Webb can do about that? Yeah, so uh, there are sort of in, in more general sense, dark energy is is this is a mysterious force that seems to uh, to push the universe apart, right? So uh, in the past, before this was discovered, we thought that you know we had to had the big bang and the the, the the universe is expanding, and that expansion would slowly slow down over time, like over cosmic time. But what we see instead is that there's something that pushes it, so it actually starts to accelerate again. And dark energy is this, this mysterious force that 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 does that. Um, so Webb will look at cosmological questions, right? which means what are the what are those basic properties of the universe? And something as as basic as that expansion speed of the universe, Webb will will look at in more detail. Right? So there is a, and maybe related to dark dark energy. Um, there is what's called this, the, the Hubble tension, which is a different type, different ways to measure um, uh, the, that expansion speed. The Hubble constant gives different answers. Right? So there are observatories that look at this this, early, this afterglow of the Big Bang in, at microwave rate. So this is this is the very very beginning of the universe when the Big Bang happened uh, in this in this hot plasma. It it it, it it emitted the, its, its first light was was able to penetrate the universe at three hundred thousand years after the Big Bang. That afterglow you can you can look at, and and look at the properties of the early universe. And one of the things that it yields to is the expansion speed of the universe. But another way to do it is a more direct way, where you measure the, uh, the directly measure the distance to different objects in the universe. And then you measure the expansion speed of the universe by measuring how how red shifted the light is, you know how fast they're moving. Um, so those two methods turn out to give a bit different results, and we don't understand right now why that is. And it's only very recently that that measurements have become precise enough to indicate to us that there really are two different measurements. Like whenever you take a measurement, there's an, there's, there's a, an uncertainty on it. And so if you get two different numbers, if the uncertainty is large, you can't necessarily say that they're really different. But now those uncertainties are small, and we think that those, those are really different numbers. And we don't know what's going on, and it could be different physics. So, so Webb will, will, will uh, go out and uh, measure much more precisely distances in the universe. Uh, using various methods, there's like three different methods that can be used, and you also all have programs to do do that. And so we'll get a much more precise measurement of this tension, how big it is, and and that would help co cosmologists figure out you know, if there's any kind of new physics going on here. Uh, and I can't tell you what that is because I, I don't think anybody knows at the moment. They just know that there's a there's a bit of a problem. Indeed, yes. And what about planetary science? Will this telescope help us understand the solar system better? Will it look at objects within the solar system, asteroids, infrared auroras, Kuiper belt objects, things like that? 
Yeah, so, so Webb can observe any object in the solar system from the orbit of Mars and beyond. We can't look at things inwards of that because you would get your point too close to the sun and things move too fast for us to track them. Uh, and there are programs to look at basically every object in the solar, in every larger object in the solar system. You know, Mars, the, the giant planets, their moon systems, their ring systems, Kuiper belt objects, um, all those things. So you mentioned the Kuiper belt, right? So these are, this is the the area of the solar system from the orbit of Pluto and beyond. I mean, Pluto itself is probably a Kuiper belt object. So these have these these, these thousands potentially of frozen worlds that are the size of uh, up to the size of Pluto um, that are this archaeological record of the of the early solar system consisting mostly of, of ice. We know relatively little of these objects because they're so distant and they they emit in reflected light from this from the sun but they're so distant that that reflected light is becomes very very dim. Uh, so you really need a large telescope like like Webb to look at them. And, and again, Webb will, because it has infrared vision, it allows us to see the composition of the surfaces. You know, we, we, we did this with Pluto, right? We know it has it has like frozen oceans of, of nitrogen and whatnot. We don't know very much about the other Kuiper Belt objects because we haven't been able to send probes out there, but Webb is sensitive enough that we can actually measure that composition and do this for a large, relatively large number of them. I think in the first year, we'll look at 50. Um, that's very exciting. Uh, we also look at, again, using this molecular vision of Webb uh, to look at the, uh, the geysers from uh, uh, moons around uh, Jupiter and, and, and Saturn, like Enceladus and Europa, like these moons that have, under, uh, that have, that have, that have deep oceans under, the, under an ice cap. And sometimes this ocean, this, you know, the ice cap breaks and the ocean is able to escape through geysers and we can measure the composition of those oceans with with web and the programs to do that as well it'll be very exciting to, to see that it yeah it will and what about planet the so-called planet nine could we be able to look for it with with web um yeah so so again so i to to find planet nine is it's probably planet nine is probably not that faint mm -hmm. uh but uh you would have you have to look at and most of the sky to be able to find it so that's not we're not going to do that with web again because it's not a survey survey telescope but if somebody else finds it and there are searches for it we would be able to characterize it very quickly and me measure its composition uh its other properties its size and, and so on so i'm sure that then you know if that happens then then we would contribute uh, fundamentally to understanding of, of that object Right. Are there any threats to this mission, like micrometeorites or even cosmic rays? Could something uh, harm harm the telescope? Um, so uh, the, the question of micrometeorites is certainly something that's that's been looked at, and um, the observatory is uh, is built to be resistant to that. L two is a very empty place. I mean, space is huge. It's, it's, it's quite. It's very unlikely that any any spacecraft gets hit by something big enough to destroy it. But occasionally there are micrometeorite impacts. Um, so any kind of sensitive electronics in web is is shielded. It's basically armored so that a micrometeorite won't penetrate that to destroy electronics. The the sun shield itself um, it has five layers in it and has that for thermal reasons. But uh, they're separated in the way they are also because if a micrometeorite goes through it, uh, it will do so at an angle so that sunlight will never get through all five holes. If that makes sense. Um, yes. Yeah, so, so that works. The mirror itself is uh, is also resistant to that. I mean, that they might get you know parts of it might get hit by mic micrometeorites, but what will happen is it will just slightly decrease its reflectivity over time. Um, not something that that would destroy it. Um, cosmic rays are there again. It, again, it's shielded to some extent from them. Uh, we've had a lot of experience with other spacecraft at L two um, to to shield sensitive electronic from cosmic rays, even during solar storms. Um, and so we believe we'll be, uh, we'll be all right there as well. Right. So this mission is expected to last at least 10 years now, I think. So could there be possibly crewed missions there in the future to, to service the thing? Um, well, so, so uh, well, for, first of all, um, in principle, uh, you, one could do some things with, with a servicing mission. It's not designed for this at all. Like one of the things that have been talked about is refueling, right? So that is the, that is the ultimate 
no, the amount of fuel we have is the ultimate time or life limiting factor because the L2 point is not a completely stable point. If you didn't do anything else, if you just put a spacecraft out there in that orbit, it would actually drift away over time. So once in a while, we actually have to do a little rocket burn. It's called a station keeping burn to keep it in that orbit. And when you've done enough of those, you'll run out of fuel eventually. It turns out that we have a lot of fuel. We, we, we have for more than 20 years, uh, which see. is well well more than mechanism lifetime moves for, for uh, or mechanism lifetime for the instruments and, and other things. Um, so you could potentially uh, think about it. it. It's conceivable you could refuel it, but um, changing out instruments, making changes to that kind of hardware, is, is, is it's not designed for that. It would be very difficult, I think. I see. So you are a planetary scientist. You look into the uh, formation of planets and the origin of our solar system. So what is it that you are the most excited about for, for this telescope? Um, so... I think one of the things I'm most excited about is this TRAPPIST-1, what's called the TRAPPIST-1 planetary system. Now, of course, you are asking me to choose between all my children. You know, if I'm putting <laughs> on you know, one of them, it, it, will, it, it might be that one. So TRAPPIST-1 is this very exciting exoplanetary system. It's a, it's, it's a system that's actually older than the solar system. Uh, we know that uh, there are at least seven planets in it. And these are small planets, these are rocky planets. Three of them orbit in the in the Goldilocks zone where, where temperatures are right to potentially have liquid water on them, three of them. Uh, now, the, the problem with this system is that it orbits uh, a star that is smaller than our sun, so-called an M-dwarf star. These are the most common stars in the universe, uh, but they're also very active stars. They have these massive flares, much bigger than what the sun has. And these massive flares uh, have a tendency to blow away atmospheres of planets around. That's what we think anyway. So a very fundamental question is, do these three planets in the Goldilocks zone have atmospheres or not? Again, this is an old system. If, if M dwarf stars over time blow away atmospheres of planets, these, these these planets would not have any atmospheres. On the other hand, they could have atmosphere. And so Webb will act will in the first year will go and look and that's answer that very basic yes no question, do they have a dense atmosphere or not? If the answer is that they have a dense atmosphere, then these may well be this kind of planet around M dwarf stars might be the most likely place to find life elsewhere. If they don't have atmospheres, it's not very likely when you have to go look elsewhere. So I think it's a, that's a very big question on this, as in this journey on the way to understanding how common is life and are we alone or not. Oh, so very excited yes. to, that, to see that, that answer. Anything else that you're excited about? Um, yeah, well, then I'm, then I'm excited about the, this, uh, this discovery space, right? And what, is, what, what will we see that we did not expect to see? And I, and I think some of those will come out very quickly, right? Because again, we're, we're 100 times more sensitive than anything else that has been there before. It's like traveling to, uh, you know, to a, to a, to a new continent, right? And you, we have, we have only seen it from, from afar, right? And one, at one, some point you, 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 you step on the beach and you know, what is there? So it, it's really this, this, this journey of, uh, of discovery. And what is next for NASA? So we, you spoke about the Roman telescope. Mm -hmm. What else is coming up in the de next decade or two? Um, so, so there's a Roman telescope. So that's already uh, being built right now. So that that will mm -hmm. that will happen. Um, so the way uh, it works in the U.S. in figuring out what observatories we build is done through a process called the Decadal Survey. So every ten years, the American National Academy of Sciences organizes a review uh, with input from the American community, asking all astronomers, "What would you?" like to do over the next 10 years. And one of the things that these decadal reviews often come out with is that they put up a highest priority um, space mission. And the highest priority space mission that they identify usually gets built, right? So Roman was the highest priority, Webb was the highest priority at some point, Hubble was the highest priority and so on. Um, and so uh, this this uh, dec decade, the 2020 decade, that review, just uh, that report just came out and they identified that uh, they would like the 
the, the next, well, first of all, they would like to have a new suite of great observatories. Um, so so there, there's, there's three different uh, observatories that we would like to build over time. They didn't necessarily pick between them, but they did say that uh, the observatory, the next observatory that works at visible, ultraviolet visible and infrared wavelengths should be the next one. This is one that has should have the capability of not like Webb, um, measure the composition of planets transiting the stars limited to to stars that are smaller than our sun that may not have atmospheres, but to directly see next to a star uh, a planet, measure its composition, and be able to measure the composition of an Earth-like, Earth-sized planet around a solar-type star. Right. So if there is another identical solar system out there, that observatory should be able to find it and and measure the composition of, of an Earth-sized planet. Uh, so that that's very exciting. It doesn't have a, a formal name yet, uh, but uh, that is that process is basically starting now to to build such a telescope. Now this is a generational process. Just like Webb took twenty five years to do, this will you know also take more than a decade um, to accomplish. So we're looking at launching that maybe mid the mid twenty forties. So mid twenty four. It is truly generational these projects here. But I'm amazed always of how it seems that 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 we, we are we are actually capable of executing these generational projects. And you'd think that at the whims of politicians, you know, these things get canceled. But some of them persist and, and web is a demonstration that that we can't do that. Um and you know we, we have to do it that way because there's no other it, it, it takes the time it takes. If you want to answer these big questions, if you want to build these biggest observatories, you really have to use a generation to do it. And what is LUVOR? I hear about uh, this new proposal which is a larger James Webb kind of telescope. Is that being considered seriously? Well, so so the the, the mission I talked about is this uh, this ultraviolet optical infrared, right? So that is mm -hmm. the UVOR and LUVOR. That's LUVOR, I see. Okay. Well, it, it, it is and it isn't. Right? So it comes from that concept, uh, but it's a bit smaller. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's not large, maybe it's medium. It's, it's, it, it will be about the size of, of Webb, about six and, a, six and a half meters, six, six and a half meters. Uh, but it will just operate in the in the visible invisible light, which which is what allows it to uh, to see this Earth-sized planet around a solar mass star. And what about Lisa? Is that planned, or is it still up for consideration? Um, so, so Lisa is a uh, is a European-led mission to, oh, I see. to okay. yeah, yeah to detect um, gravitational waves. So there's been discussion about uh, NASA contributions to it. To have have a have a have a joint project in some way, but it's not something that's been selected yet for sure. But it, it's it's a it's a proposal and a concept that exists, um, and and certainly has been pushed along by the very successful uh, gravitational wave observatories like LIGO from on the ground. Right. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, Doctor Pontabidan, thank you so much for a very interesting conversation and uh, explaining all this. Thank you so much. Uh, you're very welcome. Thanks for having me.